dance of democracy continues as the fourth phase of polling begins on 29th April. Hello and welcome to Explained, where we're going to analyze the significance of this particular phase. I'm Aarti Subramaniam, and helping us understand the significance of this phase is Mirna's consulting editor, Vinay Tiwari. Thank you, Aarti. Uh, slog overs have begun, so looking forward to it. Right, 71 seats in nine states are going to polls. We're heading towards the finish line. And there are some important uh, seats and important states going to polls in this round. It's an interesting battle because two states of Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh have seen assembly polls recently. And Mumbai is going to go to vote as well. Yes, very interesting areas. New states uh, getting introduced as well in the elections. Uh, and in any case, that just excite, makes the prospect a little more exciting than what you would normally expect. Right, we're going to start off with Maharashtra today and we're going to see um, the importance of this particular phase for Maharashtra. Now, there are 17 seats that are going to polls and as you can see from the map on your screen, it was a saffron sweep back in 2014 with the Shiv Sena winning 9 seats and the BJP winning 8 seats. Now, interestingly, this is a largely urban area that's going to go to vote. You have Mumbai and all its satellite cities and satellite areas as well that are going to go to the polls. In 2014, the NDA swept Mumbai. Can they do that again? And more importantly, it's a question that everybody in Mumbai asks, is Mumbai going to actually come out and vote? Yes, and I think that's, the, that's a very big question. Uh, in fact, if you go back to 2009, Mumbai elections happened just a few days after the Mumbai terror attacks happened. Uh, and Mumbai just didn't come out to vote. In fact, South Mumbai, which was the epicenter of the attacks, voted below 30 40 percent in many ways. So uh, that's the big question for Mumbai. Uh, highly urbanized uh, city, uh, highly urbanized part of the uh, state. Uh, voting percentages play a big role uh, in the fortunes for elections as, uh, parties as well. And the other thing on the test winner is going to be the BJP Sena Alliance. They've had this will they, won't they. There's a lot of their frenemies as you would say and this alliance is going to be up uh, being facing the test as well. Yes, and I think uh, for four and a half years, uh, the, the Sena was actually in opposition to the BJP in the state. I mean, they've been talking about it openly. They've been writing about it in their papers. In the assembly, they've behaved like an opposition party. Uh, the sudden world face, which many would call it a world face because they didn't really look like as they were together, uh, has just caused a little bit of consternation in some of the Carter because they're not really sure on how the people are going to respond to that. Uh, and that's in many ways the biggest test for Sena in these elections. Right, the other important state that is going to vote this time is Madhya Pradesh. This is the first time so far that Madhya Pradesh is going to go to vote. There are six seats. The BJP has won five of them and the Congress just won. Now, this is a largely tribal area that is going to go to polls. This is a Mahakaushal area that is going to polls. But interestingly, 2018, remember, there were assembly elections in Madhya Pradesh and the Congress just inched past the BJP. So, for the BJP, this is going to be a grudge match more than anything else. It is a grudge match and also that the, uh, the correlation between the assembly outcome and the national outcome is a little different. Uh, because the Congress won that state is no guarantee that they will again win the Lok Sabha as well, purely for the reason why we see on the, on the graphic there, uh, there is half a percent or just over a half a percent gap between the two parties and in a Lok Sabha election, uh, if, you, if the two parties have a less than a percentage of gap, anything can happen. Also remember one other very important thing, the BSP is not part of any alliance. And the BSP traditionally tends to eat into the Congress vote. So there is a bit of a seesaw battle here. Uh, yes, uh, the, the Congress should be hopeful of improving from what they did last time. But certainly it's not going to be a one-sided game at all. Now, Mere, one of the reasons that the Congress did do well in Madhya Pradesh Assembly, and I think they're looking to replicate this strategy, is that of soft Hindutva. You see, they're almost beating BJP at their own game when it comes to whether it's talking about cows, whether it's, whether it's talking. It's a very different Congress in Madhya Pradesh. It is. Uh, the, the Chief Minister, current Chief Minister Kamal Nath actually jailed a couple of people under NSA precisely for the same charges which has happened under the BJP government uh, for cow smuggling in many ways. So, yes, they've played that card. It gave them dividends in the assembly elections and they've carried that forward along with the narrative of the farmers' welfare push that they've given very aggressively in the Madhya Pradesh elections. Right. Now, the other state that saw polls in 2018 where the BJP suffered a setback and is going to go to polls in this round is Rajasthan. Now, 13 seats in Rajasthan are going to polls. In 2014, the BJP swept the entire state and that was unprecedented for them. But in 2018, there was a loss. Now, interestingly, Rajasthan is one state where the party that does well in the assembly goes on to do well in the Lok Sabha polls. But 
the general sentiment during the Lok Sabha, during the assembly elections was that this was an anti Vasundra Rajay vote and not really an anti Modi vote. That's right. The slogan in the assembly elections was Modi to se bear nahi, Vasundra tari khair nahi. So they were making it very clear that they had no problems with Mr. Modi as a prime minister, but they were very upset with the chief minister. So yes, that's a very important factor. Two, if you see, you are right that Rajasthan traditionally votes for the incumbent government. But the difference between the previous verdicts and this one is the very, very narrow vote share gap between the two parties. It's, it's again less than 1%. It's almost half a percent of gap. So it's again going to be a keenly fought elections, very tight contest, and no one party can imagine that they will sweep the whole state. Right. It is going to be a close contest, no doubt. And the BJP in Rajasthan have molded their narrative, the discourse towards nationalism. You have the Congress that's talking about farm loan waiver and the Congress that's talking about Nyai. But the BJP in Rajasthan, specifically the border areas, is focusing on nationalism. And there's a big reason for it. The Shekhavadi region of Rajasthan, which is uh, uh, Seeker and Churu, uh, all of those regions send the maximum number of people to the armed forces in India. Uh, there is every house in, those, in that part of the uh, state has somebody the other in the armed forces. So nationalism, uh, anti-Pakistan, it works in that part. Uh, if you remember, just after Balakot, Mr. Modi held a rally in Churu where he actually used that opportunity to drive home that point. So that's a very important factor. Nationalism does work in Rajasthan in a large number of areas. There is one other factor in Rajasthan which is critical. Not everything is good between Mr. Gehloth and Mr. Sachin Pilot. There are still problems between the two. Uh, there is a bit of a, a one-upmanship game that is going on and how much it will play out on that day of polling is something which Rajasthan will be very keenly watching. Right, we're now going to shift focus to West Bengal, where there is one very interesting seat specifically in West Bengal that we are going to be talking about. But just the overall picture, eight seats are going to polls and the TMC in 2014 really swept this area. But this one that you see on your screen against the BJP, that is the seat of Asansol, which is represented by Union Minister Babul Supriyo, and he's contesting against Munmun Sen. The BJP has never won an Asansol before up until 2014. So for them to retain the seat is very important. It is very important and Asansol has changed a lot in terms of the narrative in that place. Uh, Asansol is actually a mining state, a uh, mining constituency. There is a lot of, Rani Ganj for instance has a lots of mines uh, and Rani Ganj is also the place where violence took place. There was there a was lot of violence that happened there during the processions uh, last year and that has changed the narrative. You can almost see in the way the campaigning is being done there that it's a complete split between the two sides. Munmun Sen, in that sense, is a bit of an outsider in Asansol. Uh, in fact, she's not even comfortable with the kind of terrain that it, and, and the way the campaigning is on, you can almost see her discomfort uh, in the kind of uh, politics that one has to do in Asansol to actually make a mark. Right, and what is explained if we don't talk about Uttar Pradesh? So, Viray's favorite state, he loves talking about <laughs> Uttar Pradesh, but um, this is going to be again a battle for the BJP because 12 seats they won in 2014. Will you just tell us the significance of this area that is going to polls? This is largely the Bundelkhand region along with Awadh. So what is the historical and political significance of this? So this area is a slightly poorer part of Uttar Pradesh. This is where it's largely agriculture and rural and agrarian in nature. Uh, this, these are also the districts that have suffered in terms of uh, bad uh, farm output, uh, low yields, low incomes, and that's how uh, the, the distress there has been higher. Bundelkhand has always been very poor in terms of agrarian crisis also because it has arid soil. Uh, and it is traditionally not very conducive for farming. So you have this part which is a little different from the other parts of UP. The other big uh, important point in this phase is that in this phase, uh, the BJP has replaced almost half the candidates they had last time. This phase also has five reserved constituencies and they've replaced virtually all of them. And that has created a little bit of a rebel factor. There are a lot of uh, incumbent MPs who are upset about being denied the ticket. And that has just a little bit of a side story in this phase in the overall narrative of the battle between Mahagat Bandhan and the BJP. Madam Dimple Yadav, the wife of Akhil Yadav is also going to be seeking re-election. But uh, we're now going to look at Bihar. And there's an interesting battle on the cards here between Union Minister Giriraj Singh and Kanaya Kumar, who is making his electoral debut. Uh, there's a lot of focus on Kanaya Kumar. This is going to be a battle, tough battle for him. But Giriraj Singh, interestingly, did not want to contest from Begu Sarai. This, the particular fight that we're talking about is in the seat called Begu Sarai. And he wasn't very keen on being shifted here. Yes, he was, he was an MP from Nawada, which, was, uh, which is way away from Begu Sarai. But look, there's a reason why uh, Begu Sarai is actually called the Leningrad of Bihar. And because this was always the area where the left has always done very well. 
well. CPI was always very strong. Uh, they've sent MPs from the seat earlier. One of those places where, for some reason, uh, trade union movements and other reasons, uh, they've done very well. And Kanaya is a CPI candidate. Uh, but now it has become a triangular fight. And that's the reason why uh, Giridat is, is a little upset, because he's, he doesn't know which, which will go. Also, very interesting point. Uh, Kanahya Kumar as a personality, as a campaigner, is drawing a lot of attention. And this is the only reason why two things happened. One, RJD refused to tie up with CPI because they were worried about Kanahya becoming the dominant face, uh, just even though he was a debutant. And they didn't want to, to actually share that kind of imagery. Uh, the second thing is, Giriraj has not mentioned the word Kanahya Kumar in the campaign at all. Because the party leadership believes that even if you take his name, it adds to his larger-than-life cult figure that he's acquired uh, post the controversy of the JNU uh, Students' Union. Well, it promises to be a mouth-watering clash, no less. But 71 seats going to polls and we're inching towards May 23rd which is when of course we'll know who the next government is going to be but we at Mera now urge all our viewers to go out and cast your vote because your vote will decide the next government of India.